although we use our brains, our minds, all the time, I'm using mine now, looking at things going past the window, waving my hands about in the air, talking to you, you're using yours, watching and listening. But we don't really think about how we use our brain. We don't think about thinking. Despite masses of research, we're still a long way from understanding the brain, our minds. Surprisingly, much of what we do actually know has been discovered observing the effect of brain damage. I'm going to spend some time now with Sir Sterling Moss, who's a racing driver of some renown. You'll almost certainly know the name, and if you don't, you will soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Sterling Moss. In 1962, he had a crash. He damaged his mind. He did it crashing at 180 miles an hour on a racetrack. I did it crashing at hundreds of miles an hour in a jet propelled dragster. I know, it was asking for trouble, but people damage their brains falling off ladders, crashing bicycles. In fact, every year in the UK, over one million people will be hospitalised with brain injury. But the recovery, the business of getting it working again, there's a lot of commonalities there. And I want to talk to Sir Sterling about how he went about it. I believe we're here. Sterling Moss's house. Right, let's go meet a legend. Mm. So Sterling, hello, it's Richard Hammond. I'm hanging. Morning. <laughs> nice to see you, Sterling. How are you? It is a bit nippy. Sorry about all this lot. We're just recording everything. Ignore them. <laughs> so, right, which one are we going in? You're in here, sir. Yeah. Oh, God, we've got the clothes. Oh, yeah. See, it's comfortable. All right. It's... On the way to the interview studio, Sterling showed me that even in his 80s, he's lost none of his boyish enthusiasm for the sport that made him. Motor racing, I mean, is, is, is exciting. And the excitement, really, is being able to set a car up and then drive it a bit better than the other guy can. I can't tell you, there's no other thing that gives me that same sort of, that same sort of lift. The important thing to me always was, was to get the respect of the other drivers. That's the, that's the most important. If they, if, they, if they felt that I was the man to beat, that gave me everything I wanted, really. And there's no question, in the late 50s and early 60s, Sterling Moss was the man to beat. So, a fearsome competitor and a charismatic winner. Mix in fast cars, exotic locations and a glamorous following, and perhaps not surprisingly, Sterling Moss became one of the UK's first sporting superstars. And in the process, maybe it was he who moved motor racing from a gentleman's hobby to the professional cutthroat circus it is today. And Sterling Moss has achieved the ambition of a lifetime. This is the makeup suite. You know when you're bored, when they can continue making up around the back of your head. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Please a bit more. Hello. Hello. Pauline, Are Sterling, you, Sterling. You're the Pauline. makeup Pauline. lady. Yes. Good. Yeah. Let's put Please, you go first. Here. I'll sit here and annoy you. Hey, what have you got there? Do you want some fibre lift protective volumizer? Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Do you, do you never put it on? I've no idea. She's got a lot of work to do there to repair up there. I wish you'd let me do your makeup. I'd, I'd like to feel your hands on my head. <laughs> if, you actually, if you actually didn't look in the mirror until afterwards. Uh, should we change places, Pauline? Yes, please. Right, I'll take this chair. Why does he get the manly just slap it on his balding paint? <laughs> there you go, so that's a big mechanical and makeup. She doesn't, go around the, she doesn't go around the back of your head to finish the makeup. Well, it'll she'll get <laughs> stuck in there. Huh? Yeah. If I give you mine, will you clean them for me? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I'll put that there. My father was a dentist. This one? Yeah. 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 I lost so three, you lost three, four. Three. And that was, a, that was an that? early shunt, wasn't it? Yeah, Where that was were... a wheel came off in, in, uh, in Naples. That night, my father flew me home and two knocked out and two broke. And so he pulled the other two out right then and there. But so how old were you when that came out? 19. Oh, well, then any 19-year-old yeah. man losing yeah. those teeth is going to feel... Yeah. Pretty difficult with girls, you know. Especially with girls. 
extracurricular determination, exactly. it would have stood in your way. <laughs> Luckily, my father was a good dentist, so <laughs> they matched. <laughs> right, we should go and right. sit down in our little room. Look at that. Gosh. It's magnificent, isn't it? Isn't that fantastic? Only the best for you, look. Oh, my God. It's huge. It's afternoon, everybody. Is it fair to say, Stanley, there's a good place to start, is it fair to say that you've always considered the reason for your immense success as a racing driver and accolades as the greatest ever, it is down to this as much as anything else, it's down to what's in there? Yes, because that controls everything. I mean, when you, one has to realise that one's brain is what tells you to move your finger. I mean, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. Therefore, that brain is telling you how, how to, much to turn in, when to feather off, when to put the foot down. Or, so, therefore, it has to be, yeah. But why is your brain able to do that better than another man's brain? Is it a better brain or is it a particular type of brain? I think it's a particular type. I think, I think you take what you've got and then you try to improve on it. So is it then? a result of a crude experience perhaps beyond simply racing. Is it a combination of experiences outside your box in the competition? I know you had a tough time at one of your schools. Did all these inform you as a man that, that I, that's part of it? I think the way you're composed, which comes from the life you have led and, and the way you've been brought up, I think all those things obviously help. I think the fact that I was sympathetic towards what motor racing was because of my father and my mother being in there, I think gave me a, a leg up. Both of Sterling's parents were into motorsport. His dad was known as the racing dentist because he was a dentist and he raced. Winning and being brave was instilled in Moss at an early age, whether on a horse or in a boxing ring, aged four. My father would put me into in this thing, you know, a four-year-old boxing. I went in there and I wanted to win. I don't want to just beat, be beaten around. I want to win. That's what I'm there for. Whether I like boxing or not is irrelevant. What I want to do is beat the man I'm against. Spotting Sterling's competitive streak, his father let the 18-year-old loose in a race car. He won his first competitive drive, and right there began a lifetime's craving for the danger of racing and the joy of winning. Well, the Moroccan Grand Prix of 1958 goes to Sterling Moss. I mean, I love motor racing. I love, I love the sport. I like the dangers and important. I mean, when you're a kid, I mean, I, I was racing because I, I liked the danger. The danger was something that made it really important. It's something, if I make a mistake, this is serious. And somehow that, that, that increased my, my pleasure of being able to race. I mean, if I could go into a corner and come out one yard or five feet or something ahead of the man behind or gain that much, I'd feel like a million dollars. Our brains have a reward pathway, evolved to encourage beneficial actions like eating, sex or winning. Victory triggers Sterling's brain to release a feel-good chemical called dopamine. The sense of satisfaction and well-being motivates the desire to do it again. For top racers like Moss, the pleasure of winning is amplified by the adrenaline-type rush of risking death. And in the 50s and 60s, death was often just around the corner. In the 50s, because we were racing on ordinary roads, if you made a mistake, any one mistake could be your last mistake. For an average of three to four you know, good drivers, top drivers, killed every year throughout the, uh, the 50s. In 1957, Tony Brooks crashed out at Le Mans. Less than a month later, he and Moss would be teammates at the British Grand Prix. Tony Brooks excursion into the sand at Terre Rouge and the leg injury he received was to have an important bearing on the British Grand Prix at entry. Brooks and Moss were racing a car each for the Van Wall team, but Brooks was still suffering. Sterling started in pole position, then his car failed. Drivers could switch cars back then, so Moss took over from Brooks. Still stiff and sore from his Le Mans injuries, 
Tony was not sorry to hand over to Steph, who was in the cockpit almost before Tony was idling. The race now became a masterclass from Sterling. Mars is always at his best when the odds are against him, and he set off on one of the most sterling drives of his career. He gained 12 seconds, four places, and went on to win in a characteristically determined display of concentration. He's already acknowledging the cheers of the crowd, and they raise and cheer to a man. Watch it. Yes, motor racing is unique as a sport because it's this level of concentration that's sustained for hour yeah, yeah, after hour. Yeah. And you, your races were... Well, up to ten hours. Oh, well, Mealy was over ten hours. Yes, the Formula One was all three hour minimum. So three so, to ten hours yeah. of concentrating at a, a level that we're yeah. never doing anything else. No. So other sports, tennis, they concentrate very hard, but then they have a nice sit down. Yes. You know, in, in racing, obviously, you can't. I mean, your life your life's dependent on it. That's the, that's the one thing in your favour, is that when, when, when you might be killed, you pay more attention. You know what I mean? But you're really concentrating yes, at exactly. the time. Exactly. Yeah. You don't <laughs> want to go this way. Let's just have a quick look at the Mini Mini. In the early 50s, the race that demanded more concentration than most was the infamous Italian road race, the Mila Miglia. Some 800 cars raced a 1,000 miles around central Italy, with excited crowds lining the winding route. Yeah, it was a recipe for disaster. Look at the people, you see, look at that. I mean, I do not like driving towards people. You know, that sort of speed, I mean, it really is quite a, an awful thing because you just don't want to touch somebody. As well as avoiding enthusiastic spectators, the other hazard needing extra attention was the other drivers. The race was open to all comers. I mean, you might say to your friend, you know, when you're at the pub, uh, yeah, let's go in this and have a go. And, of course, they could. If you had a car and you were around there, you could get a number on the side and you'd be off. With all that to contend with, driver concentration was necessarily intense. In the 1955 race, Sterling's extraordinary ability to concentrate created an unusual problem. On this concentration point, the story runs that went in the millimilia. Yeah. They were attempting to have a system whereby you could communicate with your co-driver through headphones. This is yeah. quite technologically advanced at the time, I imagine. Yeah, but that didn't work. We, I mean, we tried that out, and uh, I was speaking to somebody after, long, long after that, and, and they said, when, you, when you're really concentrating, you don't feel pain, and, and you don't hear things. I mean, you, it's what you see. So he said, it, wouldn't, it just wouldn't work. When concentrating, the higher reasoning part of the brain, the frontal cortex, diverts attention to those inputs demanding the most thought, the most effort. The effect is to ignore other inputs. You know, men can only do one thing at a time, that kind of thing. Well, it's medical, that's the way our brains work. Moss was concentrating so much on the road ahead that his brain was blanking out the sounds around him. He was even deaf to the instructions of his navigator, Dennis Jenkinson, Jenks, who was in the seat right beside him. You came up with a solution, didn't you, to the problem of you couldn't hear because your brain zoned it out. Yeah. We had this thing of uh, the the gadget. We had this thing we called a toilet roll. Oh, which is got there. Yeah. Now on that, that was Jenks's information pad. As we went along, he would just wind this on, and you see whatever it is, something flat out. He would interpret that by into hand signals. If you wanted me to go slower, look, he, he like this slower, and then he speed it up however much more he wanted me to slow. And this wasn't necessarily because of the noise which was tremendous, I should yeah, imagine, yeah. but it's just because your brain had prioritised visual yeah, was all exactly. it was interested in. Exactly. And I could see him in the corner of my arm concentrating down the road, but I could see his signals because he put his hand far enough forward I could see it. The brilliant yet simple hand signals from his navigator solved the problem of Moss being unable to hear when concentrating. The pair went on to famously win the Millimilia in record time, clocking an astonishing average speed of 97.8 miles an hour. But racing at these speeds not only demands extreme concentration, it also requires that when concentrating, the brain must then process huge quantities of ever-changing inputs. 
Once the flag falls and then you're off and you've got to be watching where people are, can I get dash in there, should I hold back here, wait till we go round the corner, uh, you know, all the time trying to read the track so you can work out how you're going to pace yourself, you know, watching the, the, the temperature gauges and seeing how the tyres are. So it isn't just a case of being able to hold your foot on the floor. This racing brain that's able to compute lots of data very quickly is a characteristic of all top drivers, both in Sterling's era and today. <laughs> Professor Sid Watkins is motor racing's best-known neurosurgeon and remains astonished by how a driver's brain processes the mass of information that bombards it. I make a lot of jokes about, you know, what was the neurosurgeon doing around racing drivers because they've obviously got no brain. But in fact, they are a very highly intelligent group. They take all the data that's coming into them from their body, from the way the head is moving on the neck, and their computers come out with the right solution. I do have first-hand experience of this need for high-speed data processing in a race car, and I can safely say it's just like Sid tells it, and I can't do it. I'm going to try the fucking tip. My thinking time, that was my problem. When I had a bit of an off, it's because I thought I'd left it too late to break. Then I realised I hadn't. But because I was thinking that, the car was already round the corner yeah. and I was in the wrong gear and I span. Yeah. I can't think fast enough more than anything else. But the thing you've got to rem remember more than anything else is the professionals and amateur. That's the point. Of my era, of, you, of when you tried any time you like, there's a very big gap between the very best amateur and the very poorest you know, professional. Now, it's rather like a singer. I mean, it's, every, anybody can sing, but only a few people sing really well, and then, then they get trained and it gets better. And I think the same thing with racing. I mean, experience is an enormous benefit. What I try to do, as against you in the same vehicles, is I try to say to the car, OK, now I'm going to try and benefit from this with my experience, and that's why I'm likely to get in that car and go faster than you would. And the flag falls for Sterling Moss to mark his third victory in the Monaco Grand Prix. Monaco's winding street circuit is the most testing for a driver's brain. By the time of Sterling's third win here, he had 10 years' experience of over 500 races. His brain had changed, learning to process the data bombarding his senses more efficiently. You don't just get in a racing car and become an expert driver. It's all about, as of everything in life, it's all about practice. You know, 5% inspiration, 95% perspiration. We can assume that racing drivers, those parts of the brain are going to be more developed than other people because they've been practicing it over and over again. Practicing an action improves the brain's performance and the body's. Ultimately, we can unconsciously perform complex actions. They become automatic. If I swing at, swing at you, you're going to duck. If you don't, you hit. So obviously you duck. Well, in, in, in motor racing, to me, I went out there and it was... I did it automatically. I didn't sort of think, if you're going to be really fast and, and get things to go with a the flow, then it has to be something that you do without realising you're doing it. And it's, it's well known that a lot of automatic, unconscious movement is actually quicker than if you actually have to think about moving. Brain research has proved unconscious reactions are quicker than conscious ones. It's called the gunfighter dilemma, and it goes like this. The gunfighter that draws first actually draws slower because he thinks about it. The automatic reaction of the second guy is quicker. Experiments have revealed that a reflex reaction takes a different, shorter pathway through the brain than a conscious thought. And it makes sense when you think about it. Thinking about drawing the gun takes longer than just doing it. Have you ever heard of it's a theory based around gunfighters or gunslingers? And it was an experiment that was done. The theory runs that the second person to draw in a gunfight 
will actually be faster than the first person. Is that relevant to what I you think did? it is. I think, I think if a driver has to think about it, I mean, the reason I couldn't continue after my accident is because I knew exactly what to do, but I had to think what to do. I knew I had to turn in here. Where did I turn in? I turned in 100 metres away. Where did I aim for? I aimed for exactly whereas before. It was all automatic. So with Sterling's brain acting automatically, and therefore extra quickly, Along with his courage, his ability to concentrate with incredible intensity for long periods, and by now, his considerable experience, it was perhaps inevitable that he'd rise to the top of his profession. And Sterling, with his favourite number seven, wins the Grand Prix of Europe by sheer brilliance. And he might well have stayed there, but for a dark day in 1962. It was April 24th, Easter Monday. The top drivers of the day gathered at the Goodwood race circuit for the 100-mile Formula One event, the Glover Trophy. 33 years old and in his prime, Sterling strutted his stuff, sparring with rival Graham Hill even before the race began. On pole position in his lucky number seven Lotus at the track that was the scene of his very first circuit victory, Sterling was bristling with confidence. What could possibly go wrong? Three laps from the finish, not in contention for a win, but as ever pushing hard for a lap record, Moss went to pass Hill at St Mary's Corner. Going around 100 miles an hour, he left the track and ended up smashing head first into the banking. Sterling is still unconscious. He's been unconscious ever since the accident. The mystery as to exactly what caused this accident remains, but a rather disturbing thought is that perhaps we shall never know because the chances are that Sterling, who has a concussion, a broken left leg, and a cracked rib as well as gashes around the face, might himself never remember. remember, remember, remember. Your memories of the actual crash. I have nine of them amnesia of um, four weeks. I remember chatting up a bird the night before at a cocktail party, a South African lady. And then I, the next thing I remember is coming to in the hospital, uh, which was a month later. I mean, I didn't know it was a month. Um, and I, I assumed straight away that you know, I'd be racing in the next couple, two or three weeks because I'd done that before and that had happened. Otherwise, I don't remember anything else. That was the most expensive day of my life. I had to work for a living. Up till then, I'd been paid to do what I liked. And so I suddenly, suddenly had to work for a living, so it was pretty come down to earth all of a sudden. So although you can't remember exactly what happened, uh, there, there was press coverage about it, and there are some staggering photographs, if we can find them in here, of yeah. you at the time. I'm just... They're here. Yeah. So this is immediately after it had happened. Yes, and the interesting thing there, although I was unconscious, I'm actually holding that, holding that nurse's hand. Mm. I mean, you can see I'm gripping it, rather than just, just having it out. When they got there, did they think he's at it? Well, I reckon they did, because I was, I was cramped up, and the, and the whole front was smashed in, as you can see, look. See, this, this, that, that is actually before that, because mm. they've obviously just arrived, haven't they, and they haven't pulled mm. my head back. I, I've got steering wheel, where you can see it. And, and this, this is the wheel, and get it up the right way. So that's, that's the way I'd be driving, because I'd like this on the thumbs on there. And then my head obviously went forward, because no seat belts. Which is amazing, actually, I wasn't thrown out. But anyway, it went like that, and that, that obviously get down, you know, stopped my head. So that was straight in impact. That, my head. Yes, and my, and my brain would have gone bum bum like mm. that, you know, when it happened. And, uh, you know, that was it. So what do you now know did happen? Um, well, I know I went into the bank, I suppose that's the biggest thing. Yes, but the point, no, I was coming up, actually, uh, Graham Hill was in front of me. Sterling Moss was following me through four water, a very fast right hand on the back leg of the circuit. And I was a lap behind because I had a stop for a gearbox, so I was trying to unlap myself. We were doing about 140 miles an hour and approaching a right hand leading into St Mary's. And I came up. And Graham was on the right. At this point, we slow from 140 to 110, brake and drop a gear from fifth to fourth. 
And I think they probably gave him a, a flag saying, look, somebody's going to pass you. I think he may have gone like this because you, you acknowledge the flag usually, or I did certainly. I was on the outside of the circuit when I saw Sterling's car out of the corner of my eye on my left with the outside two wheels on the grass. I probably saw him do this meeting thinking that he said, right, pass me here, because he was on a narrow line, and normally Graham was one of those drivers who went quite wide, took a wide entrance. I immediately backed off and saw that he was in great trouble and watched his progress across the grass towards the bank. See, there's Graham Hill's line. I would have gone onto the grass. The grass was damp, of course, but that was all over. Then I went straight into the bank and, um, you know, crashed the car. I noticed that there were flames coming out of the exhaust pipe, which I thought was rather strange at the time. And half an hour went by and he's, we still didn't have any news. And the first news we got was when it came over the tannoy that he'd had this accident and was being cut out of the car. And, of course, we were shocked and we waited around and till we knew what was happening and he was taken off in the ambulance and somebody drove me to hospital. And then the long vigil started. Of course, following your crash, there's lots of photographs of it, but there wasn't really straight footage of it. No. It was all from the side. Because when I did mine, of course, it was being filmed yeah. for the television. So that I have got footage of mine, which I can... Yeah, I'd like to see that. I can have a, a look at. We did show this on the telly, and it, uh, we, sort of, yeah. we wondered whether to. But do you know the honest truth why we did it? Was because... Because it's interesting. Yes, and because I figured if just one person watching, one 17-year-old kid thinks, crikey, things can go wrong in the world of television, even in our city-controlled yeah. yeah. world, they can go wrong in real life. Maybe he'll think twice before go around a corner and think maybe there will be a tractor with a bailing spike coming around yeah. the other way, so yeah. I'll be careful. Now, how do I... Should have seen the palaver when the medics let me watch this for the first time. Bloody hellfire. That's a jet engine. Well, that was the first run. Breaks when you you did. Yeah, you build it to a certain point, yeah. and then the way it gets up, gets a move on straight away, eh? Well, yeah, but it accelerates in that way that jet cars do, which is kind of it, it builds and builds. Hey, the initial acceleration is nothing spectacular. It doesn't hang about. <laughs> Now, when you put that shoot out, how much does it actually stop you? Do you really feel a oh, big it's, G? It's about, yeah, it's about minus three and a half G. Is oh, it is proper, it? Oh, proper oh it is. But it's quite gentle and it's constant and then it, it yeah, sort of yeah. drops off. Oh, yes! I'm so alive! Four months so alive. after my accident, I returned to the Top Gear studio. I talked about my early runs in the jet car and then the crash itself. And we had the runway until 5.30 and... <laughs> It is strange watching yourself when you know you were unwell. Because watching me there then talk, I don't remember that. I don't remember yeah. sitting at all. You don't you? No, not even slightly. But I, 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 rem I know that I wasn't very well then. Oh, oh, oh boy, look at that. Sure. That's the point where it goes on. That's when I was gone, I thought. Good Lord. I'm amazed you got away with it too, actually. It's more bashed up than mine, wasn't it? Mm, <laughs> mine was only friends with Ben. <laughs> but I made a more thorough job of the back end of mine than you did on yours. And you can see it start to go, and then yeah. once... Oh, yeah, yeah. And then it's just the track to the right. And you're trying to steer there. Yes, I was. Yeah. Yes, I was steering. Yeah. But clearly, that was a, never going to work, was it? No. But now, tell me, when when you, the wheel, when the the tire started to go, you, that must have given you notice. My God, something's up. Um, I can't remember. Yeah. I can remember. The problem is, you don't know, do you, how much your brain reconstructs after the accident? You said a couple yeah. of things that you thought you'd maybe thought of yes, after yes, the event. Yes, sure. Yes. Um, but 
in the versions of it that ran through my mind when I was kind of in hospital, in yeah. and out of consciousness, uh, there was a real sense of fighting something, which was when steering was going on. And I think yeah. there was a degree of steering as the tire fell apart. Yeah. But then when it burst... There was a sense of this is an emergency, and I think I'd then gone to pull the chute, which didn't deploy, and the tire burst and it turned round. And then it started to roll. As the car achieved that yeah. sort of angle, I just thought, well... This is it. What I don't get is, why did the chute not go? I don't know. I don't and know. they never found out? No. But it didn't deploy possibly because the car was sideways and the chute is designed by Drogue to pull it out that way, and it kind of wouldn't. Have memories of some of your shunts. In fact, I, I've oh, seen I you say it on that face to face interview yeah. when you said, He asked you, Have you ever thought that's it? Yes. And you have? Yes, oh, sure. It's when, when my steering broke. Have you ever really thought you were done? Yes, I have. When? Uh, at uh, Monza, uh, my steering shield at 165 on this bank track. I mean, I knew uh, going at 165 or 170, whatever it was, suddenly with my arms crossed, was something wrong. I'm not stupid. I am not normally afraid of killing myself. I am frightened of being killed by something over which I have no control. And I, and I thought, oh God, this is it. I mean, that's it. And I remember closing my eyes and forcing back. I was absolutely convinced that I was a goner. Well, that's a very similar memory then to when mine went over, because that's what happened to me. I, I did everything I could. Well, I deployed did you the black parachute. out at all, do you reckon? After that point, yes. But I've never been able to ask anybody else this. But when you've really thought it and really thought, that's it. The one thing that came out of that memory for me is there was no fear. It was the next thing to do on my list. If yeah. I'd had a to-do list, it would have said, get in car, drive car, crash car, die. And I would have just said, oh, I've got to the die bit. Now, it felt no <laughs> more... <laughs> it felt no more... Yes, now, it opens a thing. I must say, I can remember so well closing my eyes and thinking, Christ, what's going to happen? Yeah. I'm going to die, but and what, 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 does, it, what yes. does it mean? Yes. How's it going to be? Death is something which frightens me and uh, by thinking of it, it isn't going to make it less likely to happen, therefore I don't think about it. I was so worried to find out, and that's where the guilt came from. Oh, things still come back. The guilt came from thinking it was my fault. Yeah. And that's back to what you were saying on the face-to-face -face interview, you're not scared of killing yourself, but you're scared of being killed. Yeah, yeah. By exactly. mechanical failure or whatever. I was so scared I felt so guilty that I'd done something wrong, I'd messed it up. So all I wanted to hear was that I hadn't risked leaving my wife a widow and daughters yeah, without a father because I'd could do, cocked yeah. up. And it's only when they told me from the telemetry from the car they confirmed I had pulled the parachute lever. That's yeah, all I wanted yeah. to hear. I'd rather you than me, old boy. Well, <laughs> let's face I, think it, we uh, I didn't dislodge the right-hand <laughs> side of my brain, so let's not get competitive about yeah. shunts, The papers were full of it. The news hounds were there camping out on the doorstep. And we told everybody, you know, that there, were, there was nothing that anybody could say, that he was in a coma, there wasn't any news, and we'd let them know when there was. The state of coma, you were in coma for a month? Uh, yeah, for a month. I was only for a day or two. But that's a strange, because it's not asleep, but well, you're not awake. Do you have you don't any know what's happened, coma though, you? memories or dreams or anything? No, none at all. Although a coma appears like a deep sleep, and in fact, it's the Greek word for deep sleep, the brain activity in a coma is very different. It's described as an unconscious state where you can't respond physically to light, sound or pain. You can't wake a person from a coma. They must regain consciousness of their own accord. So you're in a coma for a month. I woke up, I, I have no recollection, but my wife Mindy has, she was there, when I briefly stirred out of coma. The first thing he did was just, th there was the tube, the ventilator, right down. And he just got hold of it and was... <coughs> started pulling that out. 
just fighting off God, intervention. There was nobody in the room then. Presumably. Yeah, there were my wife and all the medics were, oh, there, but were I was there. fighting them off at the same time. I was trying to pull it out. And I looked at the guy and said, "Well, wh- is, what happens now? You know, can he cope with that?" He said, "Well, we'll wait and see." So I was pulling the pipe, which is not pleasant because it goes all the way down here. And Mindy was just saying, him, "What should we do?" And they just said, "Well, he'll hurt himself if he keeps fighting with us. Let him do it." And then, of course, obviously pulled it. I couldn't breathe anymore and keeled over again. Boy, but, I'd rather do the way I did, boy. I wasn't awake to do all that mess. <laughs> nice sleep for a month. <laughs> yes, it's nice, easy. Media interest never let up while Sterling lay unconscious. His father, Alfred, updated reporters, whilst his mother, Aileen, made regular visits to be with her son. I, ha- I held his hand, you know, and I squeezed it, and he squeezed it back. And then after a little while, I said, um, hello, darling, it's Mum, can you hear me? And I think, I'm a, I don't think it was imagination that he just muttered Mum. Also in constant attendance was his secretary and assistant, Val Viper Peary. As well as dealing with up to 3,000 letters a day, she tried to be at his bedside as much as possible. I was at the hospital and um, sat with him during the days after the accident or during his coma. You sit there and you were told to talk to him to try to bring him out of the coma. I think they thought that that hearing a familiar voice would get the brain going to help them come out of the coma. The common wisdom that talking or reading to someone in a coma may help has not been disproven. In fact, although a patient can't outwardly respond to stimulation of the senses, some recent research has shown that in some cases, the brain is registering inputs. I got him to speak to start with because I was telling him about a chap that was putting in a <laughs> an internal vacuum cleaner into the house. And this chap was... Um, not terribly good, and <laughs> I was regaling Sterling with the latest up, up ongoings of the house and uh, what this chap had been up to. And I said, and you know, he's a real bastard, a real bastard. And I heard this little voice saying, bastard, real bastard. <laughs> so I thought, well, yes, you're going to be all right then. <laughs> What is your actual first memory coming out? I'm very well. You'd been in you'd been coma for weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah, I was in, and, I was in and, coma for, about like for four weeks. The first thing I remember is waking up and seeing all the flowers in there and, and facetiously saying they must have thought I was going to die, and which of course was pretty near the mark. Did, but yeah. I hadn't realised that at the time. My best friend was there, and I, I remember lifting my arm like this. He said, "What are you doing that for?" And I said, well, David, in case you, did, you didn't know, I had an accident, you know, four weeks ago, and I broke my arm. He said, no, no, you didn't. He said, uh, that's because you banged your head. I said, don't be ridiculous. Well, how can banging my head mean that I've got to lift this arm around? He said, because they wouldn't tell me, because they're frightened it would, you know, worry me. And he said, well, I'm afraid that you're paralysed on that side. I said, don't be ridiculous. So, uh, so he said, well, all right, then move your fingers. Of course, I couldn't. That sounds to me anyway, as though you were still in a bit of a confused state at that point. Probably, Did, so you, you don't see it that way, do you? No, of you course not, because it's I mean, reality it's to you, you and that's, that's all you know. Oh, absolutely, I mean, it's quite frightening how you can believe one thing but it isn't right, and, and uh, I, I just did, I was obviously still, you know, mentally a bit, bit, uh, bit mixed, knocked about. Coma classically will move on and people then tend to come out through a period of confusion and into post-traumatic amnesia. <laughs> Memories is, is, is no one structure. Memory is, is part of an integral system that goes throughout the brain. And of course memory is what we judge ourselves by. That is is where we are in, in life. That is what happened a few minutes ago. That is what we're worth. That is who we love. That is what is going on. It is very integral to our souls. Be 
did you have... I was just interested in exploring different states of mind. Uh, Post-traumatic amnesia. I don't know if that yes. you at all. Yes. Yes, I did. Obviously, we can't remember. I think I've still got it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that's, I think now it's age-oriented. It's called <laughs> being 80, I think. <laughs> I think that's the problem now, but yes, certainly I did. Oh, terrible. Yeah. I mean, I met this stunning girl, and I, I didn't know where we got, a lot, where we got to in, my, in our relationship. Mm. And so I met her after, and I uh, more or less said to her, you know, I had to say to her, how far have we gone, if you know <laughs> what I mean? Uh, which, which is a pretty difficult place yeah. to be, uh, because I just could not remember. But that's when it becomes alarming for the people around you. When yes, yes. people, my wife would come and sit with me, and at first I'd deny that she was my wife, because apparently I said my wife's French. Oh, really? Tricky. I don't know why. He said to me uh, when he came around, probably should go, because my, my wife will be here soon. I said, I, I'm your wife. And he went, no, you're not my wife's French. But she never said we have a happy, loving relationship because she didn't want to plant... She never wanted years down the road to think, hang on, he only thinks that because I planted that seed in yeah, his head yeah, and he's sure. vulnerable. Yeah. The difficulty is that our memories can be biased and we start to incorporate those other people's representations into our own feelings of what is true. I think Mindy was very wise. She didn't push the point, and I think it can be very disturbing for people whose memories are slowly returning to have questions and doubts put into their mind because they're trying to deal with enough already. So she let me, and I did, thankfully, fall in love with her again, which is good. Yeah. Feeling oneself stuck in an alternative reality or being deeply confused are just some of the symptoms of post-traumatic amnesia. Recovering from brain injury, patients might emerge with incomprehensible memories or inexplicable skills, completely changed attitudes. Sterling was briefly fluent in a language he can hardly speak. Well, he was lying asleep one night and he suddenly started to speak in French with, with an absolutely superb French accent. It isn't as though I'm bilingual or anything. I'm not. I mean, I can, st I can get away with French if my wife's there to help me, sort of thing. But it was apparently quite fluent. I yes, mean, yes. Apparently, I'm not sure it wasn't better than I could speak, actually. My, but... Birmingham, my Birmingham accent returned from when I hadn't lived in Birmingham for 35 years. I left when I was a tiny child. Well, now, you haven't got it now. How long did but it But it did return briefly. Did it? Yeah. Mm. It took about 30 seconds to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> The whole of, of brain injury recovery is, is a roller coaster. But normally, by the time that the patient comes out into post traumatic amnesia, he seems to be relatively normal. And so people will come flocking to see him. They'll be elated by the good news that suddenly he's better and he will be swamped. Everybody, all of his friends and family were coming to see him. He didn't feel that he'd had an accident, he couldn't remember the accident at that point, so he was thinking, well, what, what's going on? And it must have been like being in a bizarre sci-fi movie or something, you know, I'm being kept here against my will, everybody else is going on, getting on with their lives, what, why don't I know where I am or who I am or what I am? Or... Good morning, Dr Artuzio, I hope we're on time. Good morning. Yes, we have a few minutes yet. Dr Mazia, would you go ahead and prepare this patient? What then happens is it's totally overwhelming and absolutely exhausting. They can't follow the conversation. We believe the frontal lobe has an almost filtering effect so that it can cut out too many stimuli. If it has been damaged in the head injury, that filter doesn't seem to work. He'd had quite a few visitors one morning and then I, I sort of left him for about 15 minutes, walked back into his room and he was on his hands and knees on the bed with his... his on his elbows and knees, rather, with his hands around the back of his head, going, oh, the pain, my head, my head. They feel like they're going crazy. They feel like th their brain is not working, and it just, unfortunately, further hinders their progress because they have this crisis of confidence. That's 
threatening clouds, which have been there all the morning, turned this afternoon into rain. Rain, which are obviously is going to slow the practice times enormously, as we see Graham Hill in the BRM... I don't think that he really realised how bad he was. And it wasn't until he saw the first race, which I think was Monaco after that, uh, on television, that uh, he asked for a car and he wanted to, to go there. He was a little bit pathetic to start with, you know, because, oh, I want to go there, can I go there? No, you're not, you're not capable of doing it. Oh, I can, I can. But also of driver, a test, and there's Graham Hill coming into the pit, obviously something not quite right, or he may feel, and justifiably so, that with these... Wet One of the difficulties during recovery from frontal lobe can be a lack of insight. Patients seem to almost have a physical centre somewhere within that part of the lobe that enables them to self-regulate and work out what they can and can't do. How long do you think this is going to take? There's talk of you being back to racing in practically no time at all. Well, uh, the doctors are better qualified to answer, but I reckon it may take a month before I, I'm allowed to go off, you know, to get, to get fit, and maybe a month getting fit and then straighten the car. Are you going to try and persuade him to stop racing after this? I shall ask him, yes. I haven't before, but um, this time I shall, definitely. What is so often difficult is a patient is desperate to get back and prove themselves well again, and they can have totally unrealistic expectations as to what is possible. Sterling, your doctors have been quoted today as saying that you're still very weak. How do you feel yourself? Well, uh, there are weaknesses, of course, down this left side. I mean, this, this arm is not as strong as this one, but uh, I feel all right. I feel very well, in fact. How soon do you think you'll be back on the track again? Well, that depends on the doctors, quite honestly, but I think I'll be back in time for the British Grand Prix, which is the middle of uh, July, about a, about a month. You reach a point when you think, I'm fixed, I'm better, and then a month goes by, and you look back over the previous month and think, yeah. oh, I wasn't better then, was I? Now I am. Yeah, and then another month goes by and you think, oh, I was still a bit wonky. Yeah, but I had the paralysis to, to help me, if you like. Really. Because it's a because physical because manifestation. Because it, yeah, because it was, it was there for, you know, another six months. And so I think the fact that I obviously was not right and I knew I wasn't right until, until I got rid of that problem. But the danger there is that was only one manifestation of the problems that you had. Did you immediately then think that's it, I'm fixed? No. No, because I went and tried myself out with a car to see if I could race again, and the answer was no. And I could, I'm the only person who could make that. And the decision of having to say no to myself and, and make it that I'm not gonna do it, caused an enormous change in my life. Just what made you decide finally to retire from racing? Well, I went out today to Goodwood, where I had the crash, it so happens, with a racing sports car, and did about 45 minutes of lapping. And while I was doing that, I decided that I would be foolish to continue because I had lost certain things that I took for granted, such as my dexterity, my concentration, and, uh, you know, all, many things happened that normally I wouldn't even think about, and today I had to think about, think about doing them. Do you remember that drive when you decided? Yes. Yeah, I do, because uh, it was very, very depressing. I tried not to show the depression, but, it, but you know, realising that th this was the only decision I could make, which was obvious to me, because I'd been, I knew if I went back to racing, I'd either kill myself or kill somebody else. So it was not a difficult decision to make, because it's something that had to be intuitive and it was no longer intuitive. Now, although apparently fully recovered to normal health, Sterling Moss has made the decision to race no more. So in, in Sterling's case, he was about a year after his accident, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. um, the, the paralysis had left him, he was physically yep. okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Then he decided to go for a drive, and to make his own assessment. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about him doing that? How do you feel about it? Well, as he says, he was very glad I wasn't in charge of him in those days, uh, because I wouldn't have let him get in the car. And I wouldn't have let him get in the car for two years. And I wouldn't have let him get in the car until I serially assessed his psychomotor skills over a period of time. 
he says, I couldn't wait that long. It was far too soon to make a decision like that. I'm not saying that um, he would have been able to go back and be competitive for a few years, actually. But even so, it was far too early to make the decision. I mean, I know when I got out of racing, I didn't want to leave, but I, I left because it was the only intelligent thing for me to do. Because if you couldn't win, you didn't want to if I If I wasn't in there to win, yeah, exactly. And it, it's, I'm not a good loser. I don't want to go out there and make up the field. And therefore, it wasn't that difficult, but it was hard. Trying to meet you in that period after, say, a year afterwards, Yeah. Does this resonate at all with you? That I went through a long phase of wanting to wear a T-shirt, on one side of which, on the front of which, it said, I'm absolutely fine, thank you for asking. And on the back said, I'm still poor, you know. Because sometimes, with recovering from brain injury, people will just, wow, look, he's walking about and moving and everything, he's yeah. fine. As they would with you, because by then, you're physically fixed. Yes. Still the same robust soul you were when you hit the bank. Your T-shirt, the equivalent of mine, that would say on the front, I'm absolutely fine, thank you, and lucky, on the back. Did I that think I'd head on my back, I think, but I'm lost. You see, I, I reckon I, I wasn't doing what I wanted to do, therefore my life is not at the moment complete. You know, that was it. And that was the end of it. But what had changed? Was it your ability to control your arms? Was it what had actually no, changed? No, what, what had changed is what I used to do was, was automatic. Now was a conscious thought. Everything had to be thought out. It was no longer what my life was. I was no, no longer could, could I write a piece of prose that was really worth reading. You know what I mean? And, and so therefore I had, I had changed. I mean, my life had been changed and I obviously along with it. The pathways in his brain, developed and honed by years of top flight racing, had not fully recovered from the accident. For Sterling, what was once second nature behind the wheel was now a conscious, tiring and slower effort. These days, what we try to do is we try to ensure that people only have positive experiences because the risk of a setback is so overwhelming in head injury because it seems to affect their very entity. You see, when, when can you go back? And he couldn't have been an also-ran, and he wouldn't have wanted to tarnish his image, ever. Sterling led across the line to win his first Grand Prix and to go down in history as the first British driver to win this event. And I'm going from, from being one of the most successful drivers at the top of my form and now suddenly all that I had worked for was taken away and I had to then start building uh, up another life which was away from that. Forget that, I can't, I mustn't look at that anymore. I've got to build an entirely new life. I had nothing, the only thing I had was my name. The new two litre Renault 20 is equipped with centralized door locking, adjustable headlights, electric windows. In fact, more luxury features as standard than any car in its class. Oh, and of course, a powerful new two-litre engine. Who do you think you are? Sterling Moss. His name still sells today, even though he never made a successful comeback. But a little of the old racing moss can perhaps be glimpsed at vintage car rallies, which he loves. So this DVD is from 92, and this is you in the rerun of the Milli Milli. Right, so, so this is... Behind the wheel, 43 years later. Yeah. What the f***? Why didn't you tell me then, you brat? Language. <laughs> <laughs> Straight oh, in. No mercy. Terrible. Put it on your head and then put it on. You're back in business here. Yeah. You're driving the same route, the same car. Yeah. Shouting at your co-driver. <laughs> Who is that, Sterling Moss? Yeah, well, that's the modern one because, because um, you know, it isn't a race. If it hadn't been a race, then obviously I would, I'd be very upset. In this one, I was a bit frustrated. 320, 3 kilometres 20. No, not the kilometres, a 
minutes, you. <laughs> oh God! It is two men arguing in a car. So there you are doing what you do. I know it's not in a race situation, but seriously. Try and tell me, rummage about in there, there yeah. will be some emotions going on, because I know even you feel emotions. What were you feeling when you're behind the wheel of that car again when you're doing things like that? Frustrated. I mean, it, the Mealy Melia now, of course, is not like it was at all. It's not a speed event. But uh, to, to go and, you know, make mistakes as we were doing uh, was very frustrating, quite frankly, and, and uh, I can't contain myself that well. Um, I am somebody who says what I think, which I shouldn't do quite often. And uh, so I'm a bit embarrassed at it, actually. I think the world will forgive you saying what you think, Sterling. Well. And then you cross the line and you pretty much nail it on time. You're absolutely bang on. How did that feel? Luck. We were ill-prepared and, and we, we were very lucky, as simple as that. Lucky is such an interesting word in this context because I'll guarantee you've been told how lucky you are mm. to be many, many, many times. Oh, yeah. But lucky? World's greatest racing driver can't race anymore. It's not luck, it's bad luck, isn't it? Yeah, I'm told I'm lucky all the time. I'd be a hell of a lot luckier if the tyre hadn't blown at 300 miles an hour. Yes, quite. That's, that's unlucky, yeah, if you ask me. Do you think you've got over yours completely? I always think that, and then a year goes by and you look back and think, mm, do you know what, I hadn't. I met somebody yesterday who I haven't seen for a year, who said straight away, big difference. Oh, really? Yeah, I think it's a very, very long road because of... because we're not hardwired, are we? We're not... there's not a load of wires and flashing lights in there. It's, it's a hideously complicated beast in there, made yeah. up of experiences and tendencies and inclinations. And it takes a long time to build it. And if you mix it up as heavily and strongly as we did, and as a lot of people do, then I think it takes a commensurately long time to settle back down and reroute itself. Yes. I find it a bit frightening. Yeah. Yes, it's frightening. It's frightening because it's something we can't control. We can't control our brain. Our brain controls us, doesn't it? I said at the start of this programme that much of what we know about the brain was learned from observing what happens when someone damages it. But it's not just medical science that learns. Sterling and I have learned a lot about our own brains as a result of damaging them. OK, so Sterling felt he couldn't react as quickly behind the wheel and he gave up racing. But it hasn't stopped him continuing to be a much-loved, respected and admired character in the racing world about which he's still so passionate. Welcome to the Northern Motorsport Hall of Fame. Is this where we're meant to be? That's right, sir. Oh, good. What time should we be here? You're absolutely on time, sir. Sir so Jackie Stewart and Sir Sterling Moss. Uh, but nevertheless, because I felt, you see, the difference in... We're, we're t diametrically opposed, because I think racing should be dangerous, because I think, to me, that was, the, that was what it was about. When you're Here's young, the thing. You're... Sterling is 80 now. He's just spent three, four hours in a studio with me talking pretty intensely, and now he's up there doing that. His brain is still absorbing so much and then putting out the required output. I think he got better. Ladies and gentlemen, to Sterling Moss. Coming up next this evening, how the Motoring Magazine programme has almost taken over telly in a few moments with The Car Show. And then at nine this evening, we're back in the heart of horror with the final part of Mark Gatiss's History of Horror. Stay with us. <laughs>